Well, at the end of our last lecture, we had just begun to look at the rise of the phenomenon of scholasticism as a theological enterprise, and I was trying to make the difficult argument that scholasticism is really important and really valuable and shouldn't be dismissed as an uh, entirely neg negative movement. In fact, it was a, a great effort on the part of great minds in the Middle Ages to wrestle with the question, what is the relationship of faith and reason? It's, it's a question the church, in a sense, has always wrestled with, that we're still wrestling with. Um, what are the uses of reason? How far can human reason take us? What resources does reason need to be reliable? And how does reason relate to faith? Is reason the foundation of faith? Is faith the foundation of reason and its proper uses? Or is it a more complicated relationship with that than that? And that's part of what uh, scholasticism set out to investigate, to reflect on. And in our wondrous century, uh, although only by a little bit, uh, one of the great theologians of the Middle Ages arose, uh, probably the greatest theologian since Augustine, and that is Anselm. Uh, Anselm uh, was a remarkable figure. He, um, he was a very distinguished churchman and able administrator. He served for a time as Archbishop of Canterbury in England. Uh, he got involved in the investiture controversy. You remember the conflict between church and state over who was actually in control and uh, was exiled a couple of times from uh, his Episcopal office. Um, but we remember him today uh, preeminently because of his great theological work, the ability with which he was able to use the mind uh, to reflect on uh, theological questions. And um, uh, one of those uh, great works of his, he lived from 1033 to uh, 1109, so he just sort of snuck over into our century, uh, but uh, he, uh, he did a lot of his uh, great work near our century and is really quite foundational to it. Even in his own day, he was sometimes called a second Augustine. That's how highly regarded he was. He was a very uh, pious man. Uh, very devoted to the Virgin Mary, uh, in, in, in a variety of ways, therefore, showed himself to be an exemplar in terms of what the Middle Ages uh, was looking for as a uh, great uh, teacher, as a great churchman. But as I say, our interest is primarily in him as a theologian, and uh, he didn't write a lot of works, but the works that he did write were quite uh, significant, and one of the intriguing works he wrote was called the Proslogium, the Proslogium, and uh, that's an intriguing work because in it he wrestles with the question, how can we prove the existence of God? And uh, he uh, talks about some of the proofs with which we might be more familiar. This is that reason-faith question. If people don't have faith, can you by reason demonstrate to them that they ought to believe there is a God, that reason shows that there ought to be a, a God? And Anselm came up with one of the most intriguing arguments for the existence of God um, that's called the a priori ontological argument. The a priori ontological argument. And um, um, the argument, uh, as summarized by a non-philosopher, again, if R.C. were here, he could do a much better job of this, but I think I can make it simple. Um, the a priori ontological argument uh, goes like this. If there were a God, in the nature of the case, wouldn't God be at least partially defined as that than which nothing greater can be imagined? I mean, isn't just in the nature of the case that if there is a God, he's got to be the greatest. He's got to be superior to all other things. Uh, if there is a God and there is such a thing as goodness, then he's the most good. If there is a God and there's such a thing as greatness, then he's the most great. If there is a God and he's powerful, he must be most powerful. If there is a God and, he, and there's holiness, he must be most holy, right? So God is that than which nothing greater can be conceived. 
Well, if there is no God, but we can conceive of God, then must it not be that the, the being than which nothing greater can be conceived must have existence? Because if he doesn't have existence, we could think of something greater. So if you can think of a God who doesn't exist, but God by definition is the being than which nothing greater can be conceived, he must exist. Because existence would be greater than non-existence. Now you're reacting exactly the way everybody reacts. A sort of profound, hmm, does, does that really work or not? And it's intriguing, some of the greatest thinkers and philosophers in Western history, ever since Anselm, have div divided right down the middle as to whether the argument works. Um, some have said, this is just ridiculous, this is just a mind game. Uh, existence isn't an attribute like every other attribute. And so you can't just add existence and then say you've proved what you wanted to prove. And Anselm would say, well, you know, this isn't like positing there's an island in the Pacific and then just saying because I posited it, I can add existence to it and it must exist. We're talking about the being then which nothing greater can be conceived. And so it really is intriguing how when you look at the history of philosophy, there are those who say, that doesn't work. And those who say, yeah, you really can't get away from that. I tend to go back and forth. I don't really have a good philosophical mind. Um, so you can ask R.C. sometime whether he thinks this argument works. I think, I think maybe it does. Um, but in any case, uh, Anselm has left philosophers uh, talking uh, at great length over this question of the existence of God and whether his ontological a priori argument uh, works. Clearly, a fascinating theological mind at work. The work of his, though, that gets even more attention is a work entitled Cur Deus Homo. Latin title of the work, which means literally, why God, man. And it um, could be translated, why the God man? Or more frequently translated, why did God become man? Why God man? If we are agreed, as the church was agreed, um, that Jesus is the e incarnation of the eternal logos, become man. If we are agreed, as Chalcedon taught, that Jesus has a complete divine nature that he had from all eternity and a complete human nature that he achieved, that he received in the incarnation, united in the one person, why? Why did God become man? What was the purpose of that? And so this uh, treatise is a treatise not on how God became man, or what did it mean that God became man, or ontologically how do we understand that God became man, but why? What was the purpose of God becoming man? And this really becomes a treatise then on the atonement. Why was it necessary that God become man? And it is one of the very profound reflections on the atonement. Like many profound things, when you summarize it briefly, it all seems kind of simple and, and obvious. And partly it's obvious because we're the inheritors of these profound thinkers that were wrestling with questions that uh, hadn't been so profoundly wrestled with before. And, and, and the brief sort of way of talking about what Anselm came to uh, is this. Man owed a debt but couldn't pay it. God could pay the debt, but didn't owe it. And only the God-man could both owe the debt and pay it. Now that's so simple. We're inclined to say, well, an idiot could have thought of that. Well, actually not. It took a lot of careful thought, a lot of, of careful reflection. And, and it rests on this notion that sin is a debt that is owed. That, that sin somehow must be 
dealt with. Uh, that God either cannot or will not, that's another theological debate, God cannot or will not simply overlook sin. Uh, sin is a problem that has to be addressed. Now, theologians debated, is it absolutely necessary that God become man to pay for sin? Or is it only hypothetically necessary? That is, is there no other way God could have done it? Or is this just the way that God chooses to do it? Uh, that's, a, that's a dicey question. Anselm seems to be saying, this is necessary. Uh, God did not come, come, become flesh except because it was necessary. This is the only way we could be saved. This is the way God acted to save sinners lost and helpless in themselves, and the God-man came to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. And so this is a really profound deepening of reflection and thought about the work of Christ, the necessity of the work of Christ. Uh, now, when we were studying ancient church history, uh, I said there, as you all remember vividly, uh, that uh, in the Eastern church, the focus remains theologically through its whole history on Trinity and Christology. Uh, their focus is on the being of God and the being of Jesus. It's in the West, because of the influence of Augustine, that focus becomes much more on redemption, on soteriology, on the meaning of salvation. Uh, that's why, in a sense, the great moment in redemptive history for the Eastern Church is the incarnation, God and man united. Uh, in the Western Church, the great moment of salvation is the crucifixion, uh, where Jesus pays the penalty of man's sin. And in the great theological work of Anselm, we see uh, a deepening, a deepening even beyond what we find in Augustine, of an understanding of the atonement, the importance of the atonement, and the meaning of the atonement. So in Anselm, we have um, a really uh, early and brilliant and powerful theologian uh, who is advancing the church in thinking carefully about uh, theological issues. Now we have uh, uh, really many theologians and uh, we'll not be able to talk about them all, but I want to at least mention uh, another theologian a little bit later than Anselm uh, by the name of Abelard. Uh, Abelard uh, lived from 1079 to 1142, so he gets us a little farther into our wonderful century. Um, and uh, Abelard is uh, principally remembered for his, um, his love of the beautiful Heloise. Do you remember that story? Uh, here was a cleric who uh, fell in love with uh, a woman uh, and uh, got into a lot of trouble uh, for that. And um, we won't go into all these sordid medieval details of his loss. But um, uh, he, too, was a very thoughtful theologian and uh, uh, wrote something very important uh, in the church in the middle of this wondrous century, a work that was published under the title Sick et Known. One of the curious things is in the Latin language is there isn't quite a word for yes. I don't know if that reflects a kind of negative spirit amongst the Romans, but uh, um, uh, this, this work is often translated yes and no. A little more literally, it would be thus and no. But yes and no gets the spirit of a, of a little better. What, what Abelard did is he went back and looked at many, many theologians that had come before him and asked what those theologians thought on a variety of theological issues, and then wrote down key quotations and demonstrated that in the history of the church on many, many theological issues, there were yeses and noes. There were theologians who said one thing and others who said another. Uh, on that particular approach, one might almost say uh, Abelard was a forerunner of the Reformation. Uh, what he was saying is tradition does not speak with a single voice. You can't look back at the theology of the church and say the theologians were always saying the same thing. We've already seen that, haven't we, with the issue of the Lord's Supper. There's a yes and a no on the Lord's Supper. 
Uh, we've seen that with the issue of images. There was a yes and a no on the images in the history of the church. And um, uh, what Abelard wanted to say is uh, we need to be aware that it's not quite so easy always to say what has the church always believed? What is the universal voice of the church? You remember in the ancient uh, church, Vincent of Lerain has said, well, binding tradition is what the church has always said everywhere, and everyone has said it. Well, that's a great ideal. The problem is nothing measures up to that standard. Um, and, and Abelard, then in the middle of the 12th century, is illustrating that in his famous work, Sick at Known, which shows that, that the Middle Ages itself had some sense at the time that this matter of orthodoxy of the voice of tradition was more complicated, perhaps, than um, uh, it was sometimes made out to be. The other thing that Abelard talked about was this matter of atonement. And Abelard became really the extreme opposite of Anselm. And this is important because Anselm and Abelard will represent two poles uh, that have continued to be present in discussions of the atonement uh, pretty much uh, ever since. And Abelard's basic position was there was no necessary debt that had to be paid. But that's to misconstrue the nature of God. It's to undermine the love of God. Uh, it's to fail to appreciate uh, the love of God. And Abelard said Jesus didn't become a man to pay a debt that we couldn't pay, but the Logos became a man in order to show us the love of God. And that the death of Christ then on the cross is not primarily a payment. The death of Christ on the cross is primarily a manifestation and an example of the love of God. And that point of view uh, initially often seems very appealing. God isn't someone who needs to be appeased. Isn't that a terrible notion? But God is always loving. God is always caring. And the death of Christ shows that. Uh, but the problem is, as uh, Bernard, for example, saw clearly and vigorously attacked uh, Abelard for his teaching, the problem is uh, how really loving is it for God to take his own son and crucify him just to show that he's loving. If the crucifixion is only to show the love of God, how good an example of the love of God is that just by itself? Now, if the crucifixion has another purpose, as Anselm argued, then it is an act of love because God is doing something that needs to be done and he's doing it out of love. But just to say it's only an expression of love, I think Bernard rightly saw, is really problematic and really undermines the notion of the love of God rather than supporting it. So we begin to see how theological issues arise, how, how really important they are. And I want to talk just about uh, one more theologian briefly uh, from this period who's, who's really very important, and that's Peter Lombard. Peter Lombard uh, was not the, uh, the creative theologian uh, that um, Anselm was. He was not the speculative theologian that Abelard was, but he was a great uh, gatherer of information, a great systematic mind, and he produced what became the fundamental textbook in theology um, uh, for the later medieval church. Lombard died in 1164, uh, and, and he wrote uh, a book that was entitled The Four Books of the Sentences. It's usually translated. Uh, one of the great problems with Latin is it only gets half translated. The, uh, the title of the book is the Libri Quatuor Sententiarum, uh, the four books of the, of the sentences. Actually, it means the four books of the opinions. He's gathering, sort of as Abelard did, the opinions of the church but he's doing it in a more orthodox manner. He's maintaining the, um, a, a kind of unity of witness uh, 
of, of the church. And the interesting thing is that uh, Lombard, when he put together the four book, books of the sentences, um, about 80% of it, it's been estimated, was taken from Augustine. It showed how much Lombard knew Augustine, how influential Augustine remained. But, but this book became the basic systematic theology textbook for the whole rest of the Middle Ages. Uh, Lombard was known as the master of the sentences. And the first thing that you did as a theological student thereafter was to master the sentences. And everything that was written theologically was written in dialogue with Lombard. So this is the, this is the fundamental systematic theology text that continued to, to guide education, to direct education in the Middle Ages, and in relation to which um, all later theology uh, relates. Again, it's not the most creative work, but it's a great summary work. It's a great bringing together. It's a great foundation from which other scholars would be able to work. And as was the case um, in the Middle Ages, one of the questions around which he danced was the question of predestination. Predestination was still being debated. And Augustine still had strong supporters and followers who held entirely to the Augustinian um, uh, decree and notion of, of predestination. Uh, Peter Lombard is very largely Augustinian and, and presents that in his, uh, in his work, but there's a kind of um, waffling, maybe. Uh, it's Lombard who first comes up with uh, a declaration about the death of Christ. Did Christ die for the elect alone, or did he die for all? And it's Lombard who came up with a great formula, Christ died sufficiently for the whole world, but efficiently for the elect alone. There's a kind of nice, maybe in-between statement, where you don't have to come down hard on one side or the other. So Lombard was kind of brilliant uh, in that way, bringing together the issues, bringing together material, and laying a foundation from which other scholars would build and develop thereafter. So as we come to the conclusion of this lecture, we see how there's a whole new vitality emerging in the theological life of the church. Uh, it'll be worked out in much more detail later, um, but, but here is a, a, a profound beginning and a very creative impetus coming into the life of the church as people are thinking, how does theology teach us about God? How does theology lead us on to God? How does theology help us understand what God is all about? Thank you very much. <laughs>